In part one of week five, we have seen that membrane potentials show fluctuations. We have seen that spike timing is not reliable. Then the question arises, what are the sources of this variability? What is the source of the fluctuations? One potential source is that there's intrinsic noise in each neuron. We have seen that ion channels open and close and uh, the number of ion channels embedded in the membrane is limited. The brain is at 37 degrees temperature. At finite temperature with a finite number of channels we expect some stochastic effects. Indeed, in recordings of ion channels we see that if the same stimulus is presented several times, the stimulus is up here, then in the first trial, the ion channel opens here, goes down, goes down, goes up again. In a later trial, the opening might be bigger. There are these fluctuations. The steps correspond to different numbers of ion channels that are open. But the important point here is that the opening and closing of ion channels is visible in the membrane and it shows up as fluctuations in the ion current flowing through the set of channels. So this is a first noise source. There's a finite number of ion channels that run at finite temperature. This leads to intrinsic noise in the neuron. However, there is also another potential source of noise, and that's what I call network noise. Neurons are embedded in the network of many, many other neurons. And let's just pull one of these neurons out of the network, then this neuron will receive input from all the other neurons. The other neurons send out their spikes. Spikes will arrive at different moments in time. The exact spike timing of the other neurons is beyond the control of, of the experimentalist. An experimentalist can, for example, stimulate visual cortex by presenting an image, say, the image of the Sydney Opera House. However, he cannot control what each individual neuron receives from other neurons, other neurons that send spikes over the synapses to the neuron from which the experimentalist is recording. Now, in order to find out whether network noise is important, the first step is to remove the network noise. And you remove the network noise by isolating a neuron. And that leads back to in vitro recordings. Suppose you inject a step current into a single neuron. Then you see that the first spike is very reliable in all the 25 trials shown here. However, later spikes are not reliable at all. On the other hand, if you inject a strongly fluctuating current into the same neuron, then you see that all spikes occur fairly reliably. So if you increase the size of the fluctuations so the size of the upfluctuations is sigma. If you increase sigma, then the reliability increases as well. And already for a fairly small amount of fluctuations, the neuron is quite reliable. Thus, neurons are fairly reliable. And that means we can attempt to predict spike times as we did already in week one and in week four. The reason that our model, the model is this trace here, that our model can predict the spike times on new input currents that were not used for parameter optimization, the reason that this is possible is exactly that neurons themselves are fairly, fairly reliable. Thus, we may conclude that the intrinsic noise plays only a small contribution in the case that the neuron is stimulated with a fluctuating current. Now the fluctuating current represents 
what a neuron is expected to see when it's embedded in the brain network. A neuron inside the brain is not going to be stimulated naturally by a step current, but rather by some kind of fluctuating current or more precisely a fluctuating conductance. So we can exclude a big contribution from intrinsic noise. But then the question is, is this image of a network noise really realistic? And we can check this by simulations. So the brain is highly connected. There are connection patterns. Different areas across the brain are more strongly connected to each other than other areas. However, locally, the connectivity looks more or less random. So let's simulate such a local population of neurons with random connectivity. And to do so, we use leaky integrating fire models, the neuron model that we have seen in week one. We have 50,000 neurons in total. 20% of these are inhibitory. The remaining ones are excitatory. And the connectivity between these neurons is random. Now what you see is that at any moment in time, different neurons fire. The activity pattern, the spike pattern, looks more or less random. Now, this population is not isolated. It will receive spike input from other populations. And the spike input will change at some point. Say, a new image is shown after the image of the Sydney Opera House. It's now the image of the Pisa Tower. And the input, the spike arrivals, the rate of spike arrivals to this population of neurons changes. And what you see is that the neurons emit more spikes, but it's still a random pattern. So what's shown up here is an average across the whole population of neurons. And this activity A is the population activity that will be formally introduced in the next lecture. This was the moment when we switched from one image to the next image. And this population responds stronger to the second image. Now, this is a population picture. An experimentalist will look at one neuron at a time. So let's focus on one of the neurons. Say this neuron here, neuron number 32,374, one of the many neurons. And uh, you see here that this neuron has emitted spikes at three moments in time. And uh, suppose we can do a intracellular recording of our model neuron so that we see the membrane potential fluctuations. These membrane potential fluctuations look not very different to those that we see in in vivo data. And then we have occasional spikes. Spikes are rare events. Let's look at these spikes. The spikes have intervals and the this interval is longer than the first interval here so if you observe a single neuron for a long time we'll see a distribution of inter spike intervals it's called the isi distribution while very very short intervals of two milliseconds are impossible because of refractoriness if you look at longer intervals we see a broad distribution of interspike intervals. The variability of spike trains manifests itself as a broad interspike interval distribution, despite the fact that the stimulus, say, a picture of the Sydney Opera House, is stationary. It's presented for a long time. Now, what I've shown here are results from simulations of a network of leaky integrating fire neurons. But the same kind of observations and measurements can be also made in vivo. So let's summarize. Neurons show fluctuations. These fluctuations have two different potential sources. The first one is intrinsic noise. Intrinsic noise seems to be a small contribution. The bigger contribution arises from the fact that a neuron is embedded in a brain network 
where it receives stochastic spike arrivals from many other neurons. And interestingly, a deterministic network of leaky endocrine fire neurons with random connectivity can reproduce the fluctuations of membrane potentials and the broad indole spike interval distributions that experimentalists have observed in vivo. Please take a moment to look at the quiz before you go on to lecture number three.